Um, it's my privilege today to interview Sandra Lubartsky and Marcus Ford. Uh, they are two people who have been doing for many years um, a locally based education and earth based education with a, a conscious focus on the development of a more ecological civilization. I'd love to give you guys the chance just to talk about your work over the past years and uh, then I'll have a few questions for you. I don't know who wants to start. Okay. okay, I guess I'll start. Um, so we're both former um, newly retired uh, professors and we've taught um, for 10 years in a small liberal arts college in the Midwest, but most of our careers has been in what we call mid-sized universities of about 30,000 uh, students. And um, we've both been active in establishing programs and, and trying to uh, get these large universities to focus more attention on environmental and um, social justice kinds of issues and have had some success. But um, our dream is to break out of that model of higher education and establish a, a very small liberal arts college, if you will, with only one major, um, a major in sustainable communities or a major in um, ecological civilization or whatever the language um, is. And so we've been working uh, for the last couple of years with that in mind. Right, so, um, you know, there, are, of course, there are many things that large universities do well but it's so clear that we've had a breakdown of, of a community and that um, students aren't, um, they, we can't necessarily assume that students know how to do the work that they really want to do in the world. And so the hope is that this is a kind of education that will help students provide them with both the theoretical grounding and the values and the way to articulate their values and the skills that they need to go into their communities and um, in many cases rebuild them, prepare them for this tremendous transition that's coming our way. And, um, and so that's a, a new experiment in, in how you do that in a formal educational institution. What, we're, we're, what we think is best is that it be a very small, local, locally based uh, institution where the community is the campus and um, where the intelligence that's embedded in the community becomes is accessed by the students. If you could uh, have an ideal location, uh, would you put it um, in the suburbs, on a farm, in the mountains? Uh, just imagine for us that you had the funding to, to, uh, to rent the space and to have that be your campus. What would you choose? Well, the important thing is that it's a community. And so, I mean, one of the problems with the way higher education has been structured most recently is that it's, it really has been isolated from the community. So that even the way parking, it, to get onto a major campus, it's so difficult because of the way parking is structured. I mean, that's a clear signal that there is this divide between the community and the campus. So it has to be, again, in a community where the, uh, there's a porousness between the university or the college and the, and the community. For us, the perfect place is Flagstaff um, because that is our home. It's where we, uh, it's a vibrant, progressive community with facing all the issues I think that American communities are facing and will be facing in the next uh, decades. Mm -hmm. I, I love the ocean, so I'd love it. I wish like that for in the by the ocean. <laughs> but no, I don't. There, um, I don't think there is one ideal location for this kind of college. I think um, one of the most famous tiny colleges, perhaps the most famous one, um, Deep Springs, is located out in isolation and um, out in the high desert on a farm. Um, Wyoming Catholic College is kind of modeling itself after that, and they're establishing themselves out on a ranch. Um, there's a, a group of people up in Sitka, Alaska, that is, um, is kind of an offshoot, or, or at least um, 
imaging themselves after Deep Springs, a lot of ties with Deep Springs, and they're going to do it in downtown Sitka, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And there's a group in Wisconsin that is doing it in a more rural setting. Um, so I, I think, I mean, my hope for the future is that in addition to big state universities, that there would be hundreds, if not thousands of small colleges, and some would be in isolation, some would be downtown, some would be in the suburbs, some would be in small towns, they'd be everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the, the location, I think, is um, every location has its own advantages and opportunities. Mm -hmm. for us, Could you talk a little bit about um, some of the concrete principles that make these examples you just cited, uh, examples of movements toward ecological civilization, what makes them ecological or what makes them help moving in that direction, in your opinion? Just some of the qualities that come to mind. Well, I, again, Mark is more knowledgeable about these small schools. Uh, I would just say that many of them, many of the newest schools that are coming online are influenced by Rudolf Steiner's mm. um, philosophy. So that's um, Thoreau College in Wisconsin and uh, Outer Bank or Outer Coast College in Alaska. Um, and by the way, can we make a plug if you agree to uh, Robert McDermott's new book on George Steiner? Have you oh, seen it? I haven't. It's a major tome uh, that uh, he claims is sort of the normative understanding of Steiner's progression and influence. Hmm. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but uh, I think that's an incredible resource. And for us, of course, we are going to be process process philosophy based. I mean, we're, we're intentionally a Whiteheadian, intended to be a Whiteheadian informed educational system or philosophy. Um, I think, you know, one, clearly one size doesn't fit all. And not all of these, or and not all of these uh, tiny colleges are earth centered or um, making sustainability the, the um, focus of, of their effort. But in our case, I, I mean, I just want to get back to the, your question about where is, where it's ideally located. For us, um, what we're really trying to do is enable students to be engaged in the democratic process to uh, prepare them for the new economy and all of this conversation. I mean, we do need a new economic system um, to prepare them to work uh, locally and to, um, to have uh, tools for resilience. So for us to be in a, a local community within a, and not isolated from these, um, these relationships is, is nice. fundamental. Nice. Yeah. Marcus, are there any other features of, uh, of these experiments that you guys would like to appropriate or that you'd want to have others who are thinking about this uh, appropriate themselves? Well, two features. One, I think it is very important to be small and or very, very small. So you have these close interpersonal relationship between uh, students with one another, but also faculty and students. So I, I think this is a case where size matters mm -hmm. and um, that very small is preferable to any, you know, even even a, a small liberal arts college of two or three thousand. There's still um, uh, barriers that are put up just by the sheer numbers. So I think size is one factor, and and I think another factor is what you might call the ethos or the worldview of, of these schools. That if I think it's essential that it have a kind of moral dimension to it and that it sees the world as interconnected. And some of these tiny colleges don't have an environmental focus, but their focus is on serving society. And I think in this day and age, there's no way you can serve society without being engaged in environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So in some cases it's implicit, in our case, it'll be much more explicit. Mm -hmm. so more um, mentioned in being small or two features. I'd what, what do you guys think are some of the features of the pedagogy um, of a college aimed at, at ecological education? Talk to us about how the teaching for you would take place. Well, the, the first thing I would say is, um, and it would be a transdisciplinary in structure. And I think a lot of, uh, back to the, a lot of these small colleges haven't yet broken out of that disciplinary mold. Mm -hmm. This, you know, the, the 
subject is life, as Whitehead said, and that requires that we not be bounded by these disciplines. The second thing is that it be highly experiential, that there be this uh, effort pedagogically to overcome uh, this split between mind and body, between heart and thought, um, and uh, that uh, that, again, that students have the opportunity not just to watch, not just to think about how things are done, not just to watch how they're done, but to actually be engaged in the, in the doing of them. Nice. So hands-on pedagogy, not the dichotomy between the theory in the classroom and then either nothing or some kind of um, activities outside of the classroom. For you, they're fused. Yes. Right, and they're fused in a way that I think is again in the making that right now we have in a lot of universities uh, that we send students into internship programs. Now those internship programs, some of them can be very good. It all depends upon who your supervisor is and how it's, it's structured. But nonetheless, there's something um, kind of artificial about that. And it's set aside and now you will do your internship. Mm -hmm. now you've, you've read this material, now you will go do your internship. Yeah. And, and that, I think, again, that break needs to be overcome. That's yeah. split. What, um, what, are, what are the outcomes? What would your ideal students who graduate from the college be able to do? What would they want to do? Yeah, I think, again, it's going to be because um, it's going to be high, highly tailored to individuals. Um, but um, in, so in my background, I've uh, developed a master's program in sustainable communities and an undergraduate program I've been engaged with in sustainable development. I think our students will go the path of many of those graduates and that is uh, to work in, in their communities, uh, all kinds of um, nonprofit uh, organizations, municipalities. Um, I've had students go um, into a lot of food system work, uh, health, health work, not as health practitioners, but as people who are um, helping to design these organizations. Yeah. Um, let me, let me go ahead, that. please, David. I mean, again, in, in the modern paradigm, there's so much emphasis on what will they be able to do or what kind of jobs will they get when they come out. And that all that is somewhat understandable. But in some ways, I, I think what we need to do is kind of shift the um, outcome question and say, what kind of people will these what kind of people will they be when they graduate? Yes. And you know, my hope is that there'll be people who understand themselves in relationship to the wider world and that will see that their own best interest lies in solving these bigger problems, that they'll see themselves not as an individual who needs an income in order to support themselves, but they'll be an, a, a person who sees themselves is tied into this community, this country, this world. And of, of course, they will need some kind of employment. Of course, there's many opportunities for doing good work in the world. But I, I don't think that that's the central yeah. question that people should be asking when you say, yeah. if I go to this school and graduate, what kind of job will I be? That's a, a great answer. The kind of formation that you guys envision and that you see happening around you is the development of persons and not just adding a few skills. Um, I would love to do a whole interview on your previous work in sustainable community and sustainable development. Um, could you just put three bullet points on the table, not about overall goals, but just three things that you did, three things that you build into the program that we might hold up as, as paradigms for others who are involved in a similar work? Sure. <laughs> I, um, I think some of the, what we did well, I think, in those programs was first the transdisciplinary approach to, um, to education. So it was inquiry based education, not discipline based question uh, education. So students had the capacity to be in a, a classroom asking an important question and being able to bring material from all different disciplines to bear on answering that question. The second thing I would say is that we worked hard to provide students actually with, with a set of skills so that, I mean, these are people who are hungry to, to go out and make a difference. So how do you make a difference? 
that was one of the qu guiding questions. What do you need to know in order to do the good work that you want to do in the world? And sometimes, to a great extent, a lot of that is pretty um, and nuts and bolts kinds of things. I need to know how to do grassroots fundraising. I need to know how to um, pr produce a newsletter. I need to know how to do videography work. Mm -hmm. So we provided students with access to those those pieces. Nice, yeah. Um, so in our last few minutes, I'd like to move back from the nuts and bolts, the details of uh, location and pedagogy, and talk a little bit about the broadest values that drive your work and how they're linked, not just to individual goals, but to something so broad as societal change, or uh, we here would call it civilizational change. You do use the word ecological civilization, which means such a major transition, but also so that what comes out is built around ecological principles. And I wonder if you could just talk about the broadest picture that motivates the work that you guys have done over the years. Go first. <laughs> well, it's, it might be a, a highly personal answer, and it might be more, you know, broader principles. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, again, I would say that um, the process philosophy has been so formative for us that we have been, we have really felt that there is this need to overcome the bifurcations that have marked the modern mentality in that split from from each other and from the natural world. So how do we reconnect with the source of life? And um, I, I would say, and then for my own work, of course, beauty has been uh, a, guiding, a guiding principle. And the question I've wondered is, how do we create beauty-centric education? Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is another way of saying value-based education and an education where value is intrinsic to mm -hmm. all beings. That's a beautiful answer. I love that answer. Did you want to add anything, Marcus? Well, I, I just want to um, answer this in, in a kind of personal way that um, th I've had a, a personal frustration with higher education and I've taught it now three different institutions. And um, so I, I don't think it's tied to any one particular institution. Um, and there seems to be just this radical disconnect between what's happening in the real world and what's happening in higher education. And um, it, it seems, you know, we hear these um, over and over again that education is the answer to all of our problems, but it doesn't seem to be the way we have formulated education now. It seems to be part of the problem. And um, so, after, again, many years of, of trying to work within uh, existing institutions, um, this, it, it just seems like, in part, it will be fun to break outside these institutions and um, try to address the issues that I'm convinced are really, really important. And, and, you know, I don't have any illusion that it will transform higher education overnight. But I, I do think that there are a handful of students around the around the country that will find this kind of education really important and right now it's not available so you know the idea of being able to offer something that's important to people who want it is is really exciting yeah beautiful let me ask as a closing question uh, and this is the big question um when you think of the kind of education that you guys aspire to and the kind of experiments you've been involved in and are now involved in, um, there's so many sectors that could contribute to this change to an ecological civilization. What is the role that education can play um, in its most ideal, its most successful, its most powerful form? Why education, why ecological education as maybe the sector that's most important in societal transformation? toward ecological civilization. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, again, um, I believe that we live in a complex society. It has many educational needs and it should have uh, an array of educational institutions meeting those various needs. But it seems like a fundamental need of every civilization is 
a way of preparing young people to understand themselves and their responsibilities to the wider community, their place in the universe, and to kind of ground them and to provide a context for all these more specialized forms of education. And it's just a sweeping generalization about higher education in the United States. We've almost completely flipped it around and we have put almost all the emphasis on these very particular and in some ways useful forms of knowledge, but we haven't given them any wider vision, any grounding, any context. And so that's, I think, um, just absolutely crucial. And I don't think state universities, the dominant form of higher education, are now set up to do that. So mm -hmm. there are some private liberal arts colleges that can do that, that have been doing it, some that could take that on, but that's the missing link, I think. That's a great answer. Sandra, take us out. Um, I think that higher education is, to put it in, uh, to frame it in Whiteheadian terms, it is a formal, intentional public form of concrescence where you have all of this data coming, coming into you. And the university or higher education is a place where you can say, first of all, let's, let's drink in all of this information. But now what are we going to do with it? We have to figure out how to coordinate it in um, in positive ways, in beneficial ways, and that that is that process of contrast and of harmony and of unification of diversity, and that's what I think universities, ed higher education, is involved in doing when it does it well. But it is, as Mark said, a, it is a process of wider and wider coordinations. And the way it's it's structured right now is narrower and narrower yeah. um, processes. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this podcast and um, for the work that you're doing. And we, uh, we send our complete uh, support and hopes that, that what you now aspire to, that you'll succeed at. Thank oh, great. you so thank much. You.